What's up everybody, Dr. Rossi, board certified psychiatrist, doctor of mystical sciences, all of that good stuff. I'm here to bring you another topic and one that I think is going to be really interesting because I get tons of comments on it all the time, you know, and it goes something like this. It's like, Dr. Rossi, I understand the DSM, I understand all these diagnostic criteria and that if somebody checks the criteria off and they're diagnosed with a the disorder, then they have the disorder. But people are skeptical of these diagnoses. They don't really know if they're valid. And that's the big part that we're here to talk about. So the reason, in my opinion, the DSM is not a Bible and you should never be calling it a Bible. You should just be saying that it's a working text that is the best way that we have currently to make psychiatric diagnoses, but this will probably change in time. Now, the reason it's not a Bible is because there's this question of reliability versus validity. So what do I mean by the two things, those two terms, reliability, validity? So when something is reliable, it means that there's going to be inter-rater reliability. So if I, as the physician, evaluate a patient and another physician evaluates the same patient, we would check the same diagnostic criteria, say for major depressive disorder, for example, and we would both come to the same conclusion. Therefore, the diagnosis is reliable. So we can reliably agree that based on these criteria laid out in the DSM, this person has major depressive disorder. The issue is reliability does not necessarily correlate with scientific validity. And that's the problem that the DSM has is that these diagnoses may be reliable, but they don't always seem to be scientifically valid. So the question that I'm posing to you guys today and the one we're here to discuss is, is there another method that we could be using to prove the validity of psychiatric diagnosis? And I think that there is, and you're going to find out all about it in the next sections. I've said to you guys before in the past that some of the psychiatric diagnoses in the DSM were not necessarily based on scientific information. They were based on sort of expert opinion they would have these committees assigned for each disorder and they would establish the diagnostic criteria and it wasn't always necessarily based on science. Sometimes it was based on convenience, sometimes it was based on, again, clinical observations that these individuals made, again, not necessarily the scientific facts. However, in the 1970s, Robbins and Goose came up with a five-phase method for establishing the validity of mental illness or mental disorders. Now, this was the first attempt that anyone had made at making a, or proving, rather, not making, proving that a psychiatric diagnosis was indeed valid. And this is very important because, again, reliability versus validity. We want validity as well as reliability. We want things to be reliable, but we also want them to be scientifically valid. So they applied their knowledge in their five phases to the diagnosis of schizophrenia. And the ultimate conclusion that they came to was that the diagnosis that was established in the DSM at the time did not necessarily capture the entire illness of schizophrenia. And therefore, the full spectrum of this illness was not captured by standard diagnostic classification. So they needed a new method. And this is their five phases, which we're going to discuss each one individually in the next section to explain how we can establish validity of a psychiatric diagnosis. So let's talk about the first phase. And I think this is important in any clinical encounter when you're meeting a patient for the first time. One of the things you're going to want to establish when you're discussing with this individual their symptoms is the clinical course of illness. So to me, this is one of the first steps in the encounter is that we want to describe the clinical picture of the disease process. And that includes establishing key identifying information. For example, the age of the first episode, so the onset of the illness, at what age? This matters, right? Because we know that things like schizophrenia for male patients, 18 to 25, female patients a little bit later onset, 25 to 35. So we have some well-established scientific data that can help guide us, for example, in the case of schizophrenia, as well as the cases of bipolar and other mood disorders. So we wanna use things like age, sex. Again, we know that females are more prone to depression and depressive episodes than males. So we're going to be on the lookout for things like that. We want to know when the illness started, what age, what timing, were there any precipitating factors? 
how many episodes the individual has had, right? Episodes matter because a lot of times people will tell you, at least in my training, they used to say all the time, if somebody's had three or more major depressive episodes, they should be maintained on medication indefinitely. So the number of episodes becomes key as well as precipitating factors. What are the events that led to the onset of an episode, for example? The key point I wanna to make to you guys here is that it's more than just symptoms. This is a bigger picture than just symptoms. And we want to establish that clinical course of illness very efficiently at the beginning of our encounter. The second phase that Robbins and Goose proposed was the idea of laboratory studies and biomarkers. Now, if you follow psychiatry, then you know that this is an area we are often criticized in because people will say, well, there's no blood tests for psychiatric disorders or there's no um, you know, imaging study, but that's not you know, entirely true. And there are some imaging studies like PET scans, for example, that can show some things, but it, it's, it's a little bit impractical in day-to-day -day practice. However, Laboratory examinations can be very helpful. For example, when you meet somebody for the first time before you prescribe medication, it would probably be a good idea to have some basic labs. For example, a basic metabolic panel to look at electrolyte disturbances, for example. Sometimes things like hyponatremia can cause altered mental status. You would also want to get a CBC to rule out any potential infectious causes, infectious disease causes that are resulting in mental health concerns. And you would also want to get things like a TSH because we know that hypo or hyperthyroidism can both present as psychiatric symptoms initially, even though it's a medical problem at that point that needs to be diagnosed and treated. So we wanna look at those things. If you're meeting a patient for the first time who has new onset schizophrenia potentially or just new onset psychosis that you can't find any other precipitating factor for, it is a good idea to have a MRI or CT scan on hand so that you can rule out potential problems, right? For example, a brain tumor that's impinging on important structures leading to hallucinations, for example. You can also rule out other things like stroke or vascular depression. You can also rule out things like multiple sclerosis, things that have established neuropsychiatric sequelae associated with them. So again, we're not necessarily using these laboratory tests and biomarkers to diagnose, but we're ruling out other potential causes of mental health conditions. We're also starting to see an importance of checking inflammatory biomarkers like C-reactive protein, for example, which is a very simple laboratory test. And we know that there's some correlation between inflammation and depression that we are still learning more about and establishing, but this may become a future test as well in the field of psychiatry. So phase three consists of separation from other psychiatric disorders. So we have to have some type of exclusion criteria that will allow us to separate one psychiatric disorder from another. Let's take an example from medicine that will help us better understand this situation. When somebody has a cough and they have blood in their sputum, for example, there are many potential causes, right? It could be pneumonia, it could be bronchiectasis, it could also be bronchogenic carcinoma, for example. So there are multiple diagnoses that produce the same symptoms. And therefore, we have to have important exclusion criteria to separate one disorder from the other. So phase three involves separation of disorders based on exclusion criteria. So phase four involves follow-up appointments or follow-up studies as well as response to medication. So this is very, very important. And often I run into this in my clinical practice is that somebody will come in and they'll want an established firm diagnosis on day one, hour one of your evaluation. And this is sometimes very difficult because again, we're looking at exclusion criteria. We're possibly looking at medical problems that the person might have leading to psychiatric conditions. We're trying to establish the course of illness. We're meeting this person for the first time. So this can be very, very difficult, but it's actually incredibly important, although maybe not the most important of the five phases we're here to talk about today. So there is the possibility that after you make a presumptive diagnosis based on that first clinical evaluation, that that diagnosis will evolve over time. And this is, again, something people often don't understand about psychiatry. They want a definitive answer right up front and don't want to give the proper amount of time and diligence to the treatment process 
to establish an absolute diagnosis that's going to be most fitting for that individual. So we are looking at the clinical response. For example, if you see somebody who you think is having a, an episode of psychosis, for example, and then you start an antipsychotic, let's say on that individual, and they, they start to get worse, maybe they start to develop mood symptoms and they start to become depressed, then you might have been off in your, diagno your initial diagnosis and you might need to reconsider that, for example. So it's very important that we have follow-up studies and additional contact with the individual and we allow the diagnosis to evolve over time as we collect more and more clinical data points. So the final phase is what I would say the most important. According to Robbins and Goose as well, this is a very, very important thing and that is genetics. So in psychiatry, we don't necessarily have genetic testing for the particular disorder. We do have some genetic testing for cytochrome P450, drug metabolism type of things, but not so much for the diagnosis of mental illness. However, we can use genetics to help guide our decisions. And this is, again, very important in my opinion because there are disorders in psychiatry that are highly heritable. So they're very, the meaning that they run in families and that they can be passed from person to person through genetics. So we know, for example, disorders like schizophrenia and bipolar disorder are highly genetic and run in families. So if the way that I would establish this in my clinical practice is I would ask about the family history. I would look for a family history of other individuals, especially first degree relatives who have schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. And if that person is then presenting, say with manic symptoms, we might be on the right track to think that individual is bipolar. So a good family history can substitute a genetic test because it is sort of an indirect measure of genetic markers and might tell us a lot about the clinical picture. All right, so how do I use this in my clinical practice to establish a valid diagnosis? Well, number one, I'm looking at phenomenology and that is a fancy way of saying I'm looking at the clinical description of the illness as told by both the patient and the patient's relatives or family, right? So this is largely what you are doing when you're conducting a history and physical exam anyway. You're gathering information about the illness, you're clustering together the symptoms necessary to make the diagnosis, and you're also, again, asking family or friends or anyone that knows the person really well to establish these things as true facts, right? That's important that this is, that this is all being told in a manner that can be validated both by the individual as well as by family members. So phenomenology is number one. Number two is family history. I am a huge believer that family history is essential because it is that stand-in for a genetic test. It tells us a lot about the possibility of highly heritable disorders such as bipolar and schizophrenia. So a good family history is going to be essential to help establish a valid diagnosis. Number three is going to be the course of illness. Again, I want to know the age of onset. I want to know about the number of episodes. I want to know how severe these episodes were. Did they lead to hospitalization? Did they lead to no treatment at all? What were the outcomes to of treatment in the past? Were treatment successful or unsuccessful? The course of illness is very, very important as well. And number four, the final one that I don't put as much emphasis in because, again, this can sometimes be difficult and nonspecific, and that is uh, treatment effects. And I'll give an example here to show you why it's nonspecific. For example, if I myself started taking a stimulant medication for ADHD, even though I don't have ADHD, I would likely derive some benefits from that medication, increased focus, ability to work harder and longer, study more, etc. right? So I would get some positive benefits even though I don't have the disorder. And again, just because I get benefits from that stimulant medication does not necessarily mean I have ADHD now. So we have to be careful when we're talking about treatment effects. So I'm going to wrap the video here, guys. and. What we have to remember is that we need to continue to try to move towards more scientifically valid diagnostic systems in psychiatry if we want this field to ever be taken seriously the way it really should be. So we want scientifically valid diagnoses and some of the things that I'm talking about here are things you can do in clinical practice right away 
and start to establish that ability. It's very important that we start to add some of these things to our clinical encounters. We should be leaving behind the pragmatic aspects of the DSM. For example, when we're making diagnoses that are based on DSM committee recommendations, or what the DSM committees believe are best for the profession and society as a whole, that's not good stuff. That's not really scientific anyway, right? And we want to move away from those pragmatic aspects of diagnosis and towards scientifically validated and evidence-based diagnostic criteria, which I believe we are on our way to doing. So thanks so much for watching the video. I definitely appreciate it. If you are not a subscriber, please consider it. It really does help me to keep making these videos. And I will see you again soon in the next section.